All right, great. Okay, we'll do that take two. <laughs> Welcome to day two of the Honor Showcase. Uh, we've had so many Honors graduates this year, 19 people, that we had to uh, extend our showcase over four days. So you are here on day two. Uh, thank you all for coming and for offering your support to our Honors students. And just a few housekeeping notes. Um, we will have four presenters today. Um, they will be speaking for about 10 minutes each. And after that, after all four students have made their presentations, uh, you, our fine audience, will have a chance to um, ask them questions or make comments. Um, we'll ask you to uh, raise your hand or put something in the chat. Um, Lisa, who is uh, running the show, the woman behind the curtain, as it were, will be um, taking care of all the background stuff. Uh, we will be recording the session, as Lisa mentioned, and we will be um, placing this somewhere, we think on the Honor Showcase page, um, I'm not sure where else, but it will have some other public uh, presentation after this, just so you know. Uh, some of our students could not present live this week, um, but they do have their pre-recorded sessions available on the Honor Showcase page, if you'd like to take a look. Okay, so I think we will get started. Um, Alrighty, so first I would like to introduce our first presenter, Kwang Arnson. Uh, Kwang will be um, uh, narrating his PowerPoint, which Lisa will pull up in a moment. And whenever you are ready to go, Kwang, um, please take it away. And uh, audience, sit back sit and enjoy. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. My name is Kwang Arnson. And this is my presentation on a podcast that I did on New Bedford culture and the effects that COVID-19 had on the cultural organizations within New Bedford. It actually started in 2019 when I was a, I was a student at the New Bedford campus and I got the chance to just walk around New Bedford and I saw all of these places that were all within a few blocks of each other. And I wanted to get to know them all, but by, by the time that I really got into it, COVID hit and everything closed. And I was, I was disappointed, but then I learned about this opportunity and I decided to interview people from all these different organizations. And I interviewed them via Zoom and I took clips from each of those interviews and I created a hour long podcast explaining all the different aspects of culture in New Bedford and what they bring to culture, how they were affected, how they adapted. And this is my project based on that. Next slide, please. So here are the six organizations that I got in touch with. There was Sarah Henry from the Buttonwood Park Zoo, Allison Wells, a local New Bedford artist who has been in New Bedford for over 15 years and who has collaborated with many of the organizations there. Tracy Furtado Chagas, uh, a, Bristol, a Bristol teacher and also the director of the Dream Out Loud Center. Ashley Okino, the executive director of the Art Museum. Amanda McMullen, the president and CEO of the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And Carrie Cox and Samir Walker. Carrie is the president of Third Eye Unlimited and Samir Walker is a program facilitator there. Next slide, please. So each one does amazing things for the culture in New Bedford. Buttonwood Park Zoo is a major tourist attraction. During a non-pandemic year, they usually bring in around 200,000 people. Uh, they're the only zoo on the South Coast. They have many endangered species. They teach many classes to New Bedford public schools and they teach environmental classes. They teach sustainability classes and many different things. The Dream Out Loud Center empowers youth and adolescents through visual and performing arts and basically helps them reach their potential. The New Bedford Art Museum, it provides art exhibits and it's mainly those of local artists because they want to show off local artists. And it also usually represents some kind of history or represents the South Coast in some way. And they also provide art classes. 
the New Bedford Whaling Museum, I learned actually used to be called the Old Dartmouth Historical Society until the 90s. I didn't know that, uh, but it basically acts not just as a New Bedford Historical Society, but as a historical society for the area like Westport, New Bedford, Fall River, Dartmouth. And I didn't, I didn't know that until I, I talked with them about it. Then there's Third Eye Unlimited, which empowers youth through hip hop and dance, graffiti, art. And they put on this festival each year called the Third Eye Open. I got to go to it in 2018. Highly recommend it. It was one of the funnest festivals. I've, it, was, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Uh, there, was, there was dance crews. There was graffiti artists. There were hip hop artists. I've, I'd never seen that many people uh, in downtown New Bedford ever before. It was quite an amazing experience. And then there's Allison Wells, who has her own artist gallery, and it's actually right next to the art museum. And she's collaborated with the art museum. She's collaborated with the Whaling Museum, and she's collaborated with Dream Out Loud. She's a major part of the downtown cultural landscape. And another major part is the AHA Night, which happens in New Bedford every second Thursday of each month. And it's when all these cultural organizations basically provide free programming, such as classes or events or performances. And it's basically to make it, make it so that everybody can enjoy and bring in tourism, bring in culture and show off what New Bedford has to offer. Next slide, please. So COVID affected them in many different ways. Many of them had to close for many months, uh, especially during the summers when it's the most busy for tourism. Many of them had a lack of funding. They had to adapt their budget because they had to change up their exhibits. They had to make them COVID safe. They had to add in sanitation to their budget that they didn't have to before. Uh, they had to ask for more fundraising and some had difficulty keeping all of their, their staff, but the majority of them made that a priority. And many of them had to basically go online. They had to put their exhibits online. They had to put their classes online. They had to put their performances online. It, basically everything changed into a digital world and they had to basically arrive into the digital age of culture. Next slide, please. So how they worked through COVID, uh, a lot of financial support. Uh, there was so many grants given out to all of these different cultural organizations. The New Bedford government helps the zoo. It funds the zoo. Uh, basically memberships went up because people were wanting to support the New Bedford population wants to support all of these cultural organizations. They want them to succeed and thrive and survive during this time. And there were so much fundraising efforts that went into this, this pandemic and how they all were able to get through it was through the generous donations of the people of New Bedford and the surrounding areas who just love these places. And some actually during the closings got a chance to work on themselves. They got to construct new areas of, such as the Whaling Museum got to construct a new area. They reworked the budget. They got to improve on programs. They got to create new programs that they are continuing now, online programs. And that brings me to my next column, which shows that like all everything went virtual. So many things went virtual, like exhibits, lessons, seminars, performances. Social media became such a more important piece because people were Facebook live streaming performances of Third Eye Unlimited, uh, like dance, dance crew performances. And basically they were creating online exhibits where you could explore. And it was just a variation and a pivot and an adaptation to uh, an online. But some programs such as Dream Out Loud had to make it more hybrid because they learned that it, it required in-person. So Dream Out Loud had one semester online, but they heard from their families 
that they needed to go and be there to experience it. So they had to follow all of the guidelines. They had to make things safe. They had to have hygiene stations and keep people six feet apart. And that happened in all of these organizations once they reopened. They had to have one-way pathways, basically change glass and clean glass every time somebody walks through. They had to make sure people were keeping the regular distances, but they made it work. They made it work. But the major piece that was the most surprising to me was the amount of collaboration there is in downtown New Bedford. I, hadn't, I have never seen or heard of a more symbiotic cultural ecosystem. Everyone is within a few blocks of each other and they all want each other to succeed. In fact, like they all had like an email chain going together. All of these cultural organizations had an email chain that basically asked like, when are you opening? How are you opening? How's your fundraising efforts going? Um, what can we do to help? What can we do to support you in your reopening? So everyone was trying their best to just be there for each other because New Bedford is such a tightly knit community. For example, Allison Wells was given an art exhibit in the Whaling Museum and it was supposed to end this summer, but it actually is going now through the fall. So you should go and check that out. Uh, Tracy Potato Chagas of Dream Out Loud actually finally got to become a member of the zoo this past year and actually got to go to the Halloween event, Boo at the Zoo, uh, with her family. And so it just goes to show that all of these cultural organizations want to help each other and collaborate with each other. And I think they're going to continue to collaborate with each other in the future. Next slide, please. And the final question that I asked them was, when the pandemic is over, how are they going to bring culture back to New Bedford? And one of these people, I believe it was Amanda McMullen said that around 19 organizations in New Bedford have this cohort and they bring in around 30 million in revenue each year to the New Bedford economy during a non-pandemic year. And that dipped during this pandemic year, but they want to get it back up to that. They want to create more funding, create more events, but they also want to continue the hybrid and online events because, because it's, it's another variation and it can bring in more people that can't readily come to New Bedford. Uh, it basically helps reach more people out around the world, basically who want to know more about the culture of New Bedford. And Probably the biggest thing that I heard was everybody just wants to throw a party. Once, once the pandemic is over, everyone just legit just wants to have a gigantic shindig of all the cultural events because they had the virtual AHA night, which is the arts, history, architecture that happens every Thursday night, but they had to change it to virtual, but they want to bring it back to once the pandemic is over to everybody just getting together. They told me there's a potential energy of culture just waiting to be released once this, this pandemic is over. Though everyone's ready, everyone's ready. The organizations are ready, the people are ready. Everybody is excited for what's to come and what could potentially happen and even improve upon in the culture of New Bedford. So this summer, my goal is to go to every single one of these organizations and visit them and get to know them a bit better because I didn't get the chance last spring. And I really got to know them via these people and via this project. And I am eternally grateful for this project because it has opened my eyes because I didn't know much about New Bedford until I did this project. And it truly is one of the most beautiful cities if you give it a chance. And I hope that you do. I hope that you go and visit all of these places as well. So in conclusion, that is my presentation on the New Bedford culture and how COVID has affected it. I will post the podcast link in chat. I think it's gonna be somewhere else soon, uh, but I'll figure that out later but I will post that podcast in chat. 
right now. So thank you for listening and I appreciate you all very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and to our audience, um, I had the uh, great privilege of uh, listening to the full podcast um, recently that, that Kwong has just put in the chat. Um, really well done. I, I think, uh, Kwong, if you end up not going into sociology, you have a, a second career choice as an NPR host. <laughs> so thank you so much for um, another slice of COVID. A lot of our students this year um, took COVID as their starting place, and we had all these different slices of, of different impacts. Um, and uh, you also show, I think, in your project how sometimes we forget to look in our own backyards to see what, what treasures lie there. Um, so thank you for highlighting New Bedford. Okay, so uh, our second presenter uh, today is Justine Gonsalves. And Justine will be ready to go in a moment. Uh, she will be talking about her project as well. All set to go, Justine? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Justine Gonzalez, and my project is on the implications of COVID-19 isolation for individuals with substance use disorders. Next slide, please. So in fall of 2020, I completed a service learning project. And this project focused on the importance of social support for individuals with substance use disorders. And in completing this project, I found that a lack of social support can lead to negative treatment outcomes. So this kind of led me to wonder, how is COVID-19 affecting individuals with substance use disorders? And how can we help reduce this feeling of isolation? Next slide, please. So my honors project consisted of a paper, which kind of just went over the diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder, risk factors, rates in our community, COVID-19 restrictions and the impacts that these had and resources and ways we can help. And I was also lucky enough to complete an information sheet for the counseling center here at BCC that kind of talked about some information on substance use disorders and resources. Next slide, please. So what is a substance use disorder? The DSM defines a substance use disorder as a pattern of long-term maladaptive behaviors and reactions brought on by repeated use of a substance. So some of the symptoms of a substance use disorder include a tolerance effect, and this tolerance of Tolerance effect may cause someone to use more of a substance to try to achieve the same effects it once had. Withdrawal symptoms, which are unpleasant reactions that occur when someone stops using a substance. Less interest in their usual activities and roles. Um, the individual may spend most of their time thinking about a substance, trying to obtain it, use it, or to recover from any of its effects. They may experience cravings for a substance and they may find themselves unable to stop using a substance despite its negative outcomes. Next slide, please. So here are some substance use rates in Massachusetts. So I found that a significant number of people in Massachusetts are living with a substance use disorder. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health found that 80,896 people were served in a treatment center in 2017. And the total number of admissions for that same year was 109,002. And keep in mind, not everyone with a substance use disorder seeks out treatment. So there could be a significant number of people who are not being counted in this data. Another shockingly large number is the amount of overdose deaths in Massachusetts. In 2019 alone, 2,020 people died from an overdose. Next slide, please. The main risk factors for substance use include social isolation and a lack of social support. And this can be seen in the Rack Park experiment that was conducted by Bruce Alexander. So during this experiment, rats were placed in two different types of cages. Both cages had constant access to morphine. One cage was bare except for the essentials and it housed a single isolated rat. The other cage had good food, wheels, toys, and other rats to socialize with. And it turned out that the rats in the isolated cages use up to 25 milligrams of morphine a day as in the earlier experiments. But the rats in the happy cages use less than five milligrams. 
And with COVID-19 restrictions, our environments are starting to look like those isolated rat cages. Next slide, please. So the research that I analyzed found that there's been an increase in substance use and overdose deaths that coincides with the start of the pandemic. Multiple sources have found a correlation between COVID-19 isolation and increased substance use. So for example, in the United States, there was a health tracking poll that was done in July of 2020 to analyze the negative impact of the pandemic on people's mental health. Of the 1,313 participants, this poll found that 12% of adults experienced an increase in substance use or alcohol consumption. And another source found alcohol sales to have risen by more than 25%. So overdose deaths have also risen since the start of the pandemic. For COVID-19, the average increase in overdose deaths each month in the United States was 680. And post COVID-19, the average increase of overdose deaths each month in the US is 2,348. Next slide, please. So I also looked at some studies that examined the impact that COVID-19 had on harm reduction centers. So these studies found that less people were using these services. A study done in Spain showed that the average number of service users between the months of January and June 2019 was 292 in comparison to the same months in 2020, which was 215. So this difference represents a decrease of 26.4%. And the decrease in service users is partly due to fear of catching the virus and the treatment center's lim limited services or changes in hours of operation. These services provide individuals with support, which is more important now than ever before. Next slide, please. So this was a big part of my project is the resources and ways that we can help. So individuals should continue to go to online meetings like AA, NA, and 12-step meetings. Other online services are important as well. And this includes things like information, support services, and counseling. It's really important for individuals to stay in contact with family and friends during this time. This could be done using online platforms like Skype and Zoom, and other options include things like in-person meetings that follow COVID-19 safety guidelines, telephone calls, writing letters, emailing, texting, sending care packages, etc. To help people with limited resources, services could provide free Wi-Fi in their parking lots or provide information on other locations that has access to free Wi-Fi. For individuals without computers, Chromebooks or other electronic devices could be temporarily provided. And depending on the number of individuals in need, in-person services could be offered. For people who aren't familiar with online resources or how to access them, tutorials or videos could be provided. And additionally, we should find ways to advertise these online services. This could be done through mailing a flyer or some type of online or, or on a television advertisement. And at the bottom of this slide, I left a link to a great resource called the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline. Help, help it has everything. You can search for a treatment program. You can get online information and resources. And it's even helpful if you know someone who's struggling with substance use. So I encourage you to write it down or take a picture of it because it's a really great resource to have. Next slide, please. And here are all my references. Thank you all for listening. Justine, thank you so much. Um, and as our audience can see, uh, another slice of COVID and how our world is being impacted from a, a different direction. Uh, thank you, Justine. And the other thing I wanted to mention, Justine started off by saying, you know, her project included um, a flyer to leave behind in the counseling center. And uh, that's often a hallmark of the uh, projects. Um, that the honors students uh, undertake where there's a deliverable, there's something that can be um, left behind at our school um, to benefit and inform the next person. And I, I really like that aspect of, of the honors program. So Justine, thank you so much. Okay, and um, we're gonna move on to our third presenter today, uh, Hannah Walsh. Hannah, um, whenever you are ready, take it away.
Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I'm doing my project on an analysis of the efforts in the Massachusetts correction system designed to cut down on recidivism rates. Next slide, please. So an overview of my project, I was looking at different aspects of the Massachusetts corrections programs that are designed to cut down on recidivism based on different interviews and statistical analysis. And I looked at this project as a continuation of my honors service learning project where I looked at the implications of recidivism for all of society. And I looked at it just on the scale of Massachusetts. So I aim to answer the questions, how effective are these programs in cutting down on recidivism rates? What do these programs consist of? How do these programs in Massachusetts compare or contrast to programs in other states? And how could efforts by the Massachusetts correction system be improved? That was what I went into this project looking for, but I found a very different outcome than I was expecting. Next slide, please. It's part one, defining the revolving door. Next slide, please. So to understand pretty much what I'm talking about, it's important to talk about what is recidivism. The National Institute of Justice defines it as a person's relapse into criminal behavior, often after the person receives sanctions or undergoes intervention for a previous crime. So in other words, basically someone gets out of jail and they end up committing a crime and it leads them right back in. Next slide, please. What leads to recidivism? Well, we have the lack of employment, lack of education, inability to find housing, substance abuse, and mental health. Next slide, please. In the United States, we are reported to house 25% of the world's prisoners while only taking up about 5% of the global population. We incarcerate 2.3 million people as of now. And to put that in perspective, that's about one in every 200 US residents. And the US Department of Justice predicted that more than 650 ex-offenders are released from prison every single year and two thirds are likely to be rearrested within three years of release. Next slide, please. To look at that on a smaller scale in Massachusetts, we have an incarceration rate of about 324 people per 100,000 people, which includes prisons, immigration detention, and juvenile justice facilities. And the most recent data on recidivism in Massachusetts is the 2015 three-year cohort which found that we have a recidivism rate of 33%. And this includes inmates on probation or parole who violated their terms, which are called technical violations. And they make up about 7% of that recidivism rate. In comparison to other states, we, um, in late 2018, we were recognized as one of the best out of 11 states in making good programs to reduce recidivism rates. Next slide, please. And to talk about these programs, it's important we know what the Second Chance Act is, which was passed by Congress in April 2008, which is, and it's essentially just a federal investment in the different factors to help reduce recidivism, such as mental health, housing, and homelessness, substance abuse, and families. And as of 2018, the Second Chance Act funded programs have served an estimated 164,000 people. Next slide, please. So part two, slowing the revolving door. Next slide, please. This is a diagram of the basic outline of reentry programs in Massachusetts. I found that each corrections facility does have their own programs, but they all follow this basic outline. Next slide, please. So the first step is the intake assessments. We have the medical and mental health screening, risk and need assessments, and educational. And these all just kind of gauge where the inmate is at once they arrive at the facility, see where, what their needs are gonna be and what programs that should be available to them. Next slide, please. The next is classification. A lot of this is based on the crime committed, um, what kind of unit they should be in. So medium, minimum, pre-release, which also has a big effect on the programs that they take. Next slide, please. And from there, we create a personalized program plan. Focuses on academic and vocational programs, prison industries, cognitive and behavioral programs, sex offender treatment, substance abuse treatment, faith-based and volunteer programs, self-improvement groups. So some examples are like academic programs like GED, 
or vocational programs. Some facilities have like cosmetology, barbers, you can get certificates for OSHA and ServSafe. Um, well, a popular cognitive and behavioral program that I found was the criminal thinking program, which helps inmates create pro-social alternatives to criminal behavior. And one program that I found really interesting and pretty cool was the needs program where inmates train service dogs for their future as um, service dogs. So they're like just puppies. Next slide, please. And next is discharge planning. So this is very similar to the previous step, except this is where they start to take the things that they're learning in these programs and apply them to the real world. So they might start filling out job applications, mock interviews, and focus on things they might need when they come out. So like housing, medical, if, for example, if they have a substance abuse issue, they focus on, instead of just pre-release treatment, they'll focus on post-release referrals. Next slide, please. And finally, there's the release or the expiration of the sentence to community integration. So there's regional reentry centers, which are open to released inmates with no post-release supervision, and the community integration, where a lot of the focus is on like IDs, social security cards. Um, there's a program that is being started up in Massachusetts called the Welcome Backpack Program, and it's essentially just a backpack full of like different like small needs like toiletries and such that someone might need depending on no matter where they go. Next slide please. Part three, how do we compare to other states? Next slide please. So when I was looking at the different states, I compared us to Washington, Louisiana, Virginia, and Alaska. Washington and Louisiana have similar recidivism rates as us at 32 to 33 percent. Virginia has the lowest recidivism rate at 23% and Alaska at the highest at 63%. And I was thinking that I would find a very drastic difference between each of the programs in the state since they all seem to have like pretty drastic differences. But I found that they all had very similar programs. It started from sentencing to release and they all focused on tailoring the needs of like education and family and employment. And that made me wonder why are these recidivism rates so different? Next slide, please. So part four, stopping the revolving door. Next slide, please. So we have the, when we look at the data in Massachusetts, it shows that these programs are likely effective. In 2006, we had a recidivism rate of 41%, and in 2015, it was down to 33%. One study even showed that receiving a GED in prison reduced recidivism by 17%. Next slide, please. So this brought me to a whole new problem is that we need, in order to conclude the effectiveness of these programs, we need a more standardized way of looking at them. I found that every state looked at recidivism from a different lens. So Virginia, for example, who has the lowest recidivism rate looked at offenders who wouldn't be considered recidivists as like technical violations, um, depending on whether or not you got a felony or misdemeanor and depending on your sentence, if it was less than a year, you weren't considered as a recidivist. Whereas in Massachusetts and Alaska or Louisiana, Louisiana they were still considered recidivists. So when you think you're comparing like apples to apples, you're really comparing apples to oranges because if we all define success in different ways, then how do we determine what success even really looks like? I also, I found a way that a good way to combat this is that we need more RCTs, which are randomized controlled trials. And these are good because they include both treatment and control groups. And this would help us gauge a more representative idea of how well these programs work for the whole population as opposed to just anecdotes and also just the numbers because clearly the numbers aren't as accurate as they should be. In addition, we since Massachusetts hasn't updated their recidivism rates in since 2015, we have no idea how we're doing now, especially with COVID and every state seems to update them at different times. So it's hard to compare different definitions from different times. And finally, I found that we should focus a little bit more on the mental health aspect of substance abuse treatment. In an interview with a corrections officer, 
he discussed, he works with a lot of these programs and he discussed how these programs focus a lot on the substance abuse as opposed to what led to it. And I think that especially during this time, this would be a very important thing to focus on because that is a big factor of recidivism. Next slide, please. These are my references and thank you for listening. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, that's a really interesting look at um, the prison system. Really important. Thank you. And uh, finally, our last presenter uh, today is uh, Sumeda Welgamaj. And Sumeda, whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Dean. <laughs> Right. My name is Sumed, uh, and I'm a CIS uh, major student at uh, BCC. So this is my project. It's uh, with uh, my. I, I'm. I look into two uh, activities that can connect us with the uh, bird watching, and uh, that that can be done at uh, Bristol Community College. Uh, next slide, slide please. So those. Uh, so the two activities are uh, one is the Osprey Nest platform. And then the uh, the, other, the other activity is the uh, bird feeder station. So before getting to the details of the study, uh, I would like to uh, talk about like how what 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 are the factors that motivated me uh, uh, to uh, do this uh, project. Next slide, please. So I came to USA in 2017. Uh, before I come to USA, uh, I was a member of the field ornithology group of Sri Lanka since 1998. And uh, most of my life, my I mean, my career uh, was uh, with I mean, was uh, I mean, kind of linked with nature. And I was a nature guide for about seven years of my life. So I wanted to continue uh, bird watching. Uh, and when when I came to USA, but still, like it took some time because first I have to adapt myself uh, into this new environment. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when after I started school, I saw this uh, class, uh, <clears throat> the uh, bio 130. So it is the study of biology and the behavior of birds. Then I, uh, I had to do a, a science elective. So I thought, okay, this looks like a, like a two birds from with the one stone situation for me. So I took the class so that uh, I can fulfill my uh, requirements. And uh, then uh, to get this, uh, I mean, to get into uh, bird watching. So that was the first time I was, I get to know like about this uh, feed of feed watch programs. Uh, sorry. Uh, about this uh, feed feed watch programs, like uh, you can watch these uh, bird feeder camps on online and. Uh, I, I I was so so into that like I I thought this is a great thing and at the same time I was thinking like if we have a feeder station at uh, at BCC and we can do the live streaming then the students can uh, watch I mean, uh, do do their observations through through, uh, through our own uh, feeder camp so that was that was on my uh, thoughts for for some time and then when we have this uh, when I had to select a project I thought. Okay, this is a good, good thing that I I could, I could uh, do something with the birds, and another factor that driven to this uh, this project was that uh, just after the pandemic, everything was like uh, people were doing different. I mean, there were hobbies, and then like uh, it evolved like bird watching also evolved as a uh, pandemic safe uh, outdoor activity. So there's a uh, popularity. Uh, for example, like. Uh, uh, a research published in the International Journal of Environmental, Re Environmental Research and Public Health reported that 12% of respondents from 97 countries reported that they had more time for bird watching. And also American Birding Association's podcast went from 5,000 downloads uh, a week to 8,000. Uh, the Audubon Society's web uh, website traffic spiked 23% in March and April 2020 compared to 2019. So uh, it's like 
So people were more into bird watching. So I was thinking like, okay, we can do some uh, activities to support that uh, movement. Then we can have more people uh, I mean, so in, like interested in bird watching and then uh, they can be kind of more uh, like uh, think, thinking about like uh, to to make make the more environmental awareness people so that uh, it, it, we can contribute to make this world a better place. Uh, so uh, with those activities, uh, we will go to the next slide and talk about the Osprey and its platform. So why is Osprey? Uh, I mean, wh why this? Uh, how, how these Osprey nest platforms came into? Um, uh, I mean, became popular. So during the mid nineteenth century. Osprey became, became an endangered species, mainly because of the use of pesticides like DDT. Uh, so uh, their population went down and then the conservation programs start up to, to support, I mean, to help them to uh, uh, increase their breeding and uh, uh, to, to support the population. And uh, Mass Audubon also uh, has a program, the South Coast Hosted Osprey Program, uh, that that uh, they they set up these nest platforms and they 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 monitor the the the, uh, I mean, the, the numbers in the area. Uh, these are two uh, nest platforms I, I saw at the Allen's Pond uh, uh, sanctuary. Uh, and next slide, please. So basically, there are two kind of uh, nest platforms. Uh, one is uh, we, it's depend on the, the location you are having. Uh, the one is the, the quadrupod platform that is uh, basically designed to uh, set an uh, 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 erector platform on the water. And the other one is the single pole platform that can be used in the, uh, on, on ground. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So when we look at uh, BCC, uh, we have our own pond with uh, some fish in there. And then, uh, I mean, we are closer to other uh, habitats that they can they can find uh, uh, adequate food. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, I have found, I've, uh, found like two locations that can uh, that where we can uh, set up uh, osprey nest platforms. Uh, location A is uh, behind the. Uh, uh, from uh, car park lot number two. And uh, that is a good place for our spray nest, uh, nest platform, but uh, it we can use a kind of a higher pole than the standard size, like 12, 13 feet. And then, uh, and then the other location is the location B, like it is on the trail uh, to the other side. Uh, that is also a good location because they kind of open in there. So in the middle, we can uh, set up a nest, uh, nest platform. Uh, next slide, please. So I know like you are thinking about like, now maybe you have questions like, okay, we have, we are talking about this, but do we have a spray around our, uh, our school? Uh, it's, uh, th this is from the eBird. Uh, these are the uh, recordings, like uh, sightings uh, of spray around the area. Uh, for April 2021, like last month. So you can see like it's, uh, we, we, we see them uh, very often in the area. And also uh, according to eBird, uh, BCC is one of the hotspots for uh, bird watching because people use our trail and they, they, they report our, well, I mean the BCC as their location. And next slide, please. And this is data from for last 10 years. I mean, these are not like, I mean, these are the places uh, people have uh, maybe recorded like several times uh, their sightings. And the next slide, please. Okay, this is the the, the observers and the dates of the uh, of uh, Osprey recordings, uh, I mean, sightings at uh, BCC. I don't know, maybe there may be names that you know too. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. I. I I see this, these two pictures are kind of similar. Uh, if this activity was approved and it, if it is successful, uh, maybe we can have our live mascot uh, at our college, at least for, for the summer, spring and the summer. Uh, next slide, please. 
okay, the, the other activity is the bird feeders. And I, even though I studied about bird feeders for this uh, project, I, I never had a bird feeder. And this is one of the occasions that I have come closer to the, closer to bird feeder, I'm feeding birds. Uh, and, and the bird, uh, Bird feeders. I mean, once I uh, started looking into bird feeders, uh, I I realized like like it is not just simple like you get a bird feeder and then put some uh, put the bird uh, seeds or whatever the food you are using and then like the birds come and eat. But it, I thought it was like that. But then I realized like when but after uh, once I start reading, like it, it's it's a science and art like it depends on like what kind of uh, bird feeder you are using and what kind of food you are using like you you attract different kind of birds and uh, it's, it's it's kind of fascinating uh, thing uh, the next slide please so these are the basic type of bird feeder types uh, and then uh, uh, like the, the the common common bird feeders uh, next slide please and these are the basic, uh, uh, like again, uh, the common uh, uh, type of bird feed um, seeds uh, they are using. Uh, next slide, please. So feeding, say feeding environment is uh, really uh, important for, for a bird feeding station. Uh, feed hygiene, like in in 2021 March, the Smithsonian Magazine uh, reported that a deadly infection caused by the Salmonella bacteria across the United States that affects songbirds. So, uh, and most Mass Audubon recommend that uh, you have to clean your uh, bird feeder like every month, and when the the, the temperature like when we have the warmer uh, temperatures, like you have to do it really often. And having having two bird feeders, like or I mean two uh, feeders uh, feeder sets, uh, uh, will will be also helpful in that. And then like you will you will attract uh, predators, uh, especially especially the hawks uh, to the where they eat these uh, small uh, birds. So uh, it is again recommended that you put your bird feeders uh, in a place. Uh, place them in a way that uh, the, the birds can easily find shelter around uh, uh, from from the uh, from these predators and then the squirrels uh, I, I saw some comments also coming about them so th these are the uh, the threats that we are having like uh, so uh, it is recommended that you should keep uh, the, the feeders kind of uh, away enough that the, the squirrels can't jump onto the feeders and then like we have the, the uh, things like uh, squirrel papples and then the uh, sky squirrel poop uh, feeders that uh, you, you can use those uh, uh, too. And the bird, and again, uh, especially with our situation uh, at the school, I think if you are setting up, uh, up a feeder, like we need to uh, uh, focus on, uh, look more into uh, the, uh, the minimize the waste. Um, around the feeders or on the ground so that because if not like uh, it will attract more rodents and uh, uh, it, it, it will be a nice situation and birdscaping is basically like keep i mean landscaping your air, the yard or the area where you're having the bird feeder so that uh, it, it will attract uh, the birds to that area next slide please so even though i was thinking about like having having uh, 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 have, having this uh, uh, live streaming and a setup in a, a camera, but I realized like it is too soon for us uh, to do that thing because be, be, before that we should make a, uh, I mean we should we should have a su successful and operational uh, feeding station. So uh, my proposal is to start small. Maybe with a uh, two I mean, large two feeder and a small two feeder, with to attract larger and smaller birds, and also minimize the competition uh, among them. Uh, you use, use you know, two separate ones. And the next slide, uh, I've, I have, I've, uh, there are, these are the two locations I'm thinking about. It's close to the G building. Uh, one is uh, close to the the, the pond uh, with those uh, closer to those trees. 
and then the other one, uh, the area between the B and the B building, uh, kind of behind the, uh, yeah, I mean, the other side of the capital area. And the next slide, please. And if one of the, if either of these uh, activities uh, got approved, uh, the bird club, uh, I'm a member of the bird club, and then uh, we will be, bird club will be uh, looking into how, how to implement in these activities with the support of the other organizations and individuals in the uh, in the Bristol community. And next slide, please. These are some of the references. And the next last slide. And thank you. And I would love to uh, discuss about more. Sumeda, thank you so much. Um, and I think we should have a round of applause for all of our presenters today. Thank you. And um, particularly for Sumeda's presentation, I, I, for those of you in the audience, you know, students uh, pick uh, various things for their projects. Some, most, most students uh, connect their project to their current major. Um, but I always like to describe the Honors 260 culminating project as, as a student's heart's desire. Um, where, uh, for example, Sumeda had um, experience uh, as a, a naturalist um, in, a, in a previous life, so to speak, and uh, he brought that interest in um, to, to his project. So um, it's wide open and can, and can go anywhere. So thank you all um, to our presenters and to our audience members. Um, if we have maybe about 10-ish minutes uh, for questions and comments, I would like to open that up. We have some things uh, going on in the chat, but I'll, I'll see if anybody has a hand up first and then we'll go to the chat. Looks like um, Bob Rack, go ahead. Hi, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, some of you are wondering about the uh, Ospreys. I, I live uh, less than uh, three miles away from campus and I was sitting in my backyard and an Osprey flew overhead last week so they're, <laughs> they're, they're right in the area. And uh, there's also um, bald eagles that are at the North Wetupper Pond. You showed a picture of North Wetupper Pond as the other areas yeah. and there are bald eagles that nest in that area. I saw one flying over my house once too. Uh, too. And uh, I actually, from where I'm sitting right here, I have a, a large pine tree and some holly trees outside. <laughs> And I, I photograph birds right out of my window while I'm sitting. So, sometime I actually have been at a meeting and a oh, bird, and I take a picture and uh, on there. But it's uh, it's quite the uh, thing. I, I, I and as you mentioned about predators, I actually have uh, hawks that come to my area because of my feeder. And I also built a waterfall in the area in my backyard. And uh, oh, the birds love that. They come and. Uh, uh, come there, but I, I have taken pictures of hawks eating birds that they caught <laughs> that they caught right outside my window. So you do get the uh, the predators that will come to your feeders as, as well. But I've had turkeys and things like that in my yard. And I'm in the, right in the center of the city, you know. So, <laughs> but I have a lot of trees and stuff, and attracts the the birds and everything. So, I I like the ideas that you had and. Uh, Good luck with the project. If you need any help, let me know. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I've, I will be talking to you. Uh, I mean, if this uh, if been moving forward of these projects for sure. Yeah. Even financial help and stuff, I could probably help you with some of that stuff. Thank you, Bob. Do we have other folks with a hand up or questions or comments for our presenters? Uh, Sumeda, are these hawks danger to pets? Uh, I, 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 I personally, I, I don't know how to answer this, that question because I, I don't know much about the, the hawks and how, what they're capable of, uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, if it, the pet is small, that could be because if it, because hawks feed on the rabbits and rodents so it depends on the size of the pet maybe maybe professor robert 
can answer that too. I mean, have some suggestions. Mm. Thank you. Bob, did you raise your hand again or was that from before? Sorry, I missed it. You're muted, by the way. <laughs> okay, there I'm unmuted. Uh, you mentioned about the hawks being a danger to pets. And not, not too much. They're mostly interested in, uh, if, I guess, if you had something small enough, that uh, a very tiny dog or something like that, or kittens or something like that, they may uh, do that. But most of the time, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're hunting the birds and things like that that uh, are around. But I also wanted to mention to Kwong, you mentioned about going to different places. You know, I've lived in Fall River all my life and in this area. And uh, I've seen the the uh, evolution of like the Buttonwood Park Zoo and the uh, uh, Whaling Museum and things like that. So, you know, when you please go to those things, you know, you you will en enjoy the Whaling Museum is a, a fascinating place as, as well for anybody to go see that. They actually have a, I think it's a, a model of a whaling ship right inside the Pequod, which I've been on and stuff. And it's it's about uh, a third, I can't remember what the scale is, about one third, but it's a model, but you can walk in it, on it. And it's it's quite the thing. And the whale skeletons that they have now, uh, some of their are, are very impressive and stuff. So it's quite the place to go. And the, and the Buttonwood Park Zoo has evolved quite a bit from when I was a kid and stuff. So it's, uh, you know, there's there all these areas of very great. Uh, we have a lot of, of things uh, in the area to go see, take advantage of. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Kwong, looks like you had a hand up. Well, firstly, thank you. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate that comment. I agree wholeheartedly with everything that you just said. Yeah, I didn't know how much the zoo has changed over the years until I had that interview, but it's an amazing place. It's the only place apparently with like Asian elephants in the area. Um, I just wanted to comment on what Sumedo was talking about because I live on the Westport River and I see nests up and down the Westport River. My parents actually got to do some of the tagging of the babies and do the tracking of the, the baby uh, the baby osprey, it's amazing. It's amazing to see the patterns of when they come and go and when they're coming and going and which ones they are. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's amazing stuff. I love your I love your presentation, my dude. It was amazing. Thank you. Just a quick comment for for Hannah. Um, I thought um, I'm always glad in, in somebody's PowerPoint when I when I sort of see the place where like they tried a hypothesis and like they couldn't find the research for it and they had to figure out something else to do. I thought that was really interesting. The point you brought up about looking at the states with similar recidivism rates and like the the programs are doing are kind of similar. So you kind of have to you know take a turn and figure out okay so what else? I thought the ideas you came up with were really good. Thank nice you. Job. Yeah, that was uh, definitely a worry for me when I came across that. I was like, so what now? Like, I don't, and I had all these other problems, but I definitely think it's something that would be like research continued for sure. I'd like to pick up on that too, Hannah, what uh, Kelly just said in, in, in your presentation when you, when you made that comment. It really struck me as um, that is true research, right? You know, what you, you come up with a question, you want to investigate something and you go off down a path. You might have some expectations and then what happens when it takes a completely different turn. And um, I, I think that that's one of the, the beauties of Honors 260 and the projects that, that people come up with because it is truly a time for our graduating students to really sink into the thing that they want to pursue. And um, while you know it's frustrating when you end up somewhere uh, sometimes that you didn't expect, it also can be really eye-opening. And I think that you showed in your presentation that that's how you took it. And um, I think that that's such a great success, just that point alone, um, Hannah. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. 
I'd also like to, if I, if no one else, I don't, uh, but uh, mentioned with, with Hannah and uh, what your, your work on there is, uh, is, and the research is extremely important because the idea of people, uh, one of the things, major things is they come out of jail with nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them don't have the support of family and things like that when they're coming out and they're, they're just stuck. You know, you, we're sent out with, okay, go ahead, you know, you're free and everything and with nothing. And so w w what else is going to happen? You know, I, I, I have, and how, how am I, I, I revert back to my old skills that got me there in the first place. And uh, one of the things that's also an interesting thing that I've been looking at is uh, uh, FASD, fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, which is, uh, people think of that as, you know, you can obviously see it, but it's such a spectrum that's on there. And it's like, there is, there is no time at all for any woman to be drinking during pregnancy, none whatsoever, you know? And so it's almost like anyone of childbearing years shouldn't drink because if by the time you figure out you're pregnant, you may have already caused damage. To your unborn child and it's it's because I, I, sorry you're getting on a soapbox but <laughs> it's something that's a, a very important and i think if they looked at a lot of people who are in the jails and stuff like that i that may be a, that may be a place of research you know is uh, something to look into because it's it's a difficult thing also to uh, diagnose and stuff because if you don't know the parents history you don't know what the story with the uh the children are and so it is work but is a lot of work being done on that trying to get diagnosis for people who have got that syndrome and because it's a it's a lifelong problem that's developing and people have to uh, work uh with uh with that and and you know help I get help all their whole lives because if it's a brain damage that occurs at the time of uh, the fetus and stuff. And so it's, it's just something to think about. Yeah, that definitely is definitely be important. Any sort of like mental illness or any sort of like disability that is really hard to diagnose is like such an important part of it. So and I think that a lot of people might forget that sometimes that like, it might not be something you can see. Thank you. Well, as we're a little bit over the hour here, um, I feel like we could keep talking for a while, but I wanna, I wanna be respectful of people's time. Um, and first of all, I want to thank our presenters today. Congratulations to all of you, really interesting work. Um, so well done, thank you all. Uh, I wanna thank Lisa Noel, who has been behind the scenes always and uh, running the show more than capably. Thank you, Lisa. And to all of our audience members today, um, you know, ever since I've been at Bristol, which is going on 15 years now, um, one of the noticeable things to me has been um, the community aspect of our school where um, we're here because we believe in education <laughs> and everybody having a chance at education and uh, relating to one another, not with um, you know an ivory tower type of way, but in a very real way. And I love the honors program for what it does in conversations like this, where you know it's a group of people um, believing in education, listening to one another, sparking ideas, using information from different disciplines to draw ourselves together. Um, and I think you know that was shown really clearly in, in this last hour, um, coming from all different disciplines um, and, and just really uh, coming together to have an intellectual conversation and hear one another think about things and, and move forward. So uh, thank you all, especially to the faculty members in the audience. The uh, honors program cannot run without your willingness to work with students. Um, and so thank you all. And I really appreciate your time today. Um, we do have uh, two more days left of the honors showcase at our lunch and learn series. So if you're available on Wednesday or Thursday, um, please feel free to drop by. And I think that about wraps it up. Thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon.
Thank you. If I could ask the presenters and Lisa to hang on a minute. Thank you all. <laughs>